Uh, well, welcome everyone. Um, I uh, need to get rid of that thing so I can advance and hopefully it will advance. There we go. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about um, in just 20 minutes, um, uh, how the landscape has changed uh, finally for women with ovarian cancer and how clinical trials have impact, impacted that and then what's happening now sort of in the clinical trial world. And I cannot, in a full disclosure, talk about everything that's happening. Um, uh, that would be probably a five-hour talk. So I'm just going to try and give you a high level of what's happened and what's happening. So first, I think there's just a little bit of sort of um, optimism. It's always nice to start with some optimism that we have for ovarian cancer. So this is uh, SEER data as of 2019, so not that long ago. And what you can see is both of those curves, which is the rate of new cases and the rate of death, are both tipping in the right direction. You know, they are going down. Um, and concurrent with that, what we see is an increase in what we call the prevalence. So the prevalent incidence means the number of new cases that we have every year. Prevalence means the number of women during the year that are live living with ovarian cancer. And so the prevalence of this disease has increased by 30%. And why is that? Some of it may be that we're curing more patients. I think we'll see that in upcoming years. But the real reason is that we are um, doing a better job with supportive care. We're doing a better job with sequencing of agents. And we're quite frankly developing new things and have lots of clinical trials that are kind of patchworking together these meaningful periods of disease control that extend life. And so more women are alive today living with their ovarian cancer um, but that's kind of our first success until we can cure. So there is a little bit of reason to be optimistic. When we think about ovarian cancer and sort of I have up here opportunities for cellular therapy because um, I shamelessly pulled this from another talk that I just gave, but it is, I'm going to talk about cellular therapy at the end of my talk, but really opportunities for um, any novel therapy. You know, where are we looking and where can we incorporate new things into this treatment paradigm? So if you start on the um, left-hand side of the screen, what you'll see is the kind of hard reality is that most of you, you know this, you're living it, present with advanced stage disease because we just, despite a lot of effort, cannot screen for this yet, uh, although we're trying. We can't screen for it yet reliably. And so um, most women present with advanced stage disease, but for those with high-grade serous and high-grade endometrioid, the majority have very exquisitely chemosensitive tumors. So the combination of carboplatin, paclitaxel, and surgery usually has folks pretty much into a complete response at the end of therapy. Unfortunately, not always, but about 80%. And then we have a variable amount of time. Some patients will be cured, and I'm going to show you some very recent data on that in a moment. But the unfortunate expectation, and I have to be honest here, is that these recur. Um, and when they recur, depending on how long it's been since the last platinum, we either retreat with platinum and we keep using platinum until platinum doesn't work or allergies develop. And then at such point, we have to turn to non-platinum based therapies. Um, and this is really where clinical trial development plays a big role uh, in trying to bring more active agents uh, into the setting of disease that has become platinum resistant. And so that's really where we're that first arrow is. We're really focused first. We have a brand new drug on the, in the recurrent setting, but then we move them up. Once we see a sign of efficacy, we move them up um, into kind of maintenance therapies following maybe a second or third platinum to try and prolong that time off of the platinum. And then even into frontline following platinum to try and improve the time to recurrence or prevent recurrences ideally. But we first develop in the platinum resistance space um, to get a sense of whether or not there's some efficacy. So when we think about frontline ovarian cancer, when I was a fellow, I was a fellow in 2004, which is a long time ago now, um, really we didn't, it wasn't that hard. You know, patients presented, we operated on everybody. You know, we gave everyone a shot at a surgery, um, which isn't the right thing anymore. And everyone got paclitaxel and carboplatin and that's all we did. That's how much you thought about it in 2004. In 2020, 2022, we think about a lot of things. We look very carefully at issues of frailty. We're very cognizant of the fact that you don't operate unless you really believe you can get all of it out 
um, and, and this timing of surgery, neoadjuvant versus interval versus primary side reduction, still kind of an unanswered question. And I think Dr. Gardner is going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, histopathology has become very important. In my day, we put every patient with epithelial ovarian cancer on a trial, mucinous, clear cell, low grade, high grade, all on one trial. That makes no sense now. Um, now we appropriately divide by the histology because it's important in terms of developing new therapies. Stage to stage, that's been the same roughly. And genomic profile has become an essential. We must offer BRCA testing to 100% of patients. It's not just BRCA, it's beyond. It's prognostic and predictive of response to PARP inhibitors and other things. And there's even new tests that we're sending now. And I'm gonna to talk to you about a few of those. So with, <laughs> with paclitaxel and carboplatin alone, like I said, it works pretty well. This is what we call a progression-free survival curve. And what, that's what you see on the left. And so how you interpret this is you can say, maybe you can see my cursor here. This is the 50%. So this is the median mark. So on average, if you follow it across by about two years, that's kind of your average progression free survival, about 20, kind of right about 24 months. You know, that's kind of how you read that. What you can see up here is this is called the shoulder. So this little initial dip is the 20% of tumors that recur very quickly after completing chemotherapy, like within six months. And that's a group of tumors that are very resistant and we're working very hard to figure out why they recur and how we can overcome that. And then you see it gets a little bit shallower, but every time you come down, this is another tumor that has recurred. And so by about three years, 80% of tumors have recurred. And so this is the problem, uh, and this is what we need to prevent. So we made a little bit of progress with a drug called Bevacizumab. You may know it as a Bastin. And so you can see the two survival curves here, and they look a little more kind of shallow than this, than this one, right? This is kind of drops pretty rapidly. These two are a little flatter because Avastin just sort of levels things out, gives you about four to six more months on average of progression-free survival, but it does not impact cure. So we're not curing people with frontline Avastin, but we are pushing out the time until that tumor recurs. And so it's an important drug, but not the magic beans. You know, it's not the thing that's gonna, that's gonna cure patients. So what has? Well, I think PARP inhibitors have. So I'm gonna show you this. This is a complicated slide, I know, um, but it basically shows you the initial reports of four studies that's, that were for PARP inhibitors following treatment of ovarian cancer. And I've divided them by biomarker. So this is just for tumors that have a BRCA mutation. And really the take home from this is for progression-free survival, the use of PARP inhibitor after frontline platinum reduces the risk of progression by 60 to 70%. That's phenomenal. That's progression-free survival. And so all of these studies resulted um, in improved progression-free survival. And that's why for BRCA, in my opinion, it is the standard of care. There is no alternative. Um, for women post um, uh, chemo. There's no alternative. You can decline it and that's okay because it's shared decision-making and, and, and women are autonomous and can make their own decisions, but you better be offered it because this is the standard of care. But the question was, okay, you did this great thing with progression-free survival, but did you cure anyone? That's what I want to know. And I think the answer is yes. So this was presented last Friday in uh, Paris at the European Society of Medical Oncology. So it's hot off the press. This is Olaparib following frontline chemotherapy. This is the placebo group. And so what you can see here is that BRCA is a good prognostic marker. So these women have done well, you know, at 84 months, so seven years, almost half of women with a BRCA mutation who participated on this trial are still alive. That's pretty phenomenal. But the, a lot of them are alive with disease because this is just overall survival. I want to know disease-free overall survival. I'm going to show you that in a minute. But here's the overall survival for patients who got frontline olaparib. 67% still alive. That's hugely different. Like you can put a person between those curves, right? You don't need to understand statistics to know this is positive. So, um, so that's where we are. 
67% versus 46%. And it's important to know that the patients that got placebo, a lot of them very appropriately got PARP when they recurred. You know, they maybe got chemo again and got a maintenance. So a lot of them got PARP inhibitors. You can see 44% um, of them went on to get another PARP inhibitor, but it doesn't catch you up. It doesn't make those curves come back together. So the most effective place to use a PARP is in the front line. I'm very passionate about that. But are these women all alive with disease and they're getting all this treatment and they're still alive or were they cured? Well, I can't definitively tell you that yet. However, what I can tell you is that 45% of the women who received Olaparib have not recurred. And so they are living at seven years off of therapy for at least five years. Because remember on, on Solo One, we stopped the PARP at two years. You only got it for two years. So they've been off for at least five years just living their life, um, not recurred. And you can look at how flat these curves look. So not many women are falling off, you know, as we go across the years. And truthfully, we're kind of in the part of the curve where, you know, we get older and people die of other things. They die of old age, right? They, other things happen. So, you know, we may never get to a median overall survival in this population because patients have done so well. So I truly believe more women are cured with this. Um, we've never seen 45% of women disease-free uh, at seven years. So this is phenomenal uh, in a big landmark presentation. The other big study that presented overall survival on Friday of last week was Paula one This is Olaparib plus Bevacizumab or Avastin versus Avastin. So the blue line is not placebo, it's Avastin. And the red line is Avastin Olaparib. And they don't have as long a follow-up because the trial was done a little bit later, but they've presented five-year follow-up, overall survival. This is the BRCA population. So 53 versus 73% of women still alive. They did not present updated progression-free survival, so I can't comment on the predictions for cure yet, um, but this is their overall survival, You know, very significant. Um, and then Prima, which is Neraparib, also presented their data. And this is blurry because I took it off a poster, so I'm sorry. But you can kind of see the same story here um, looking quite promising. So um, what about patients who don't have BRCA? What about patients whose tumors um, have are not BRCA but have that homologous recombination deficient phenotype? So this is the original progression-free survival data that was presented in like 2019 that led to all the approvals in 2020, you get about a 50%, 40 to 50% reduction in the um, hazard of progression uh, or death with use of norepirib. So again, quite strong signal in this group of tumors that have some vulnerability in how they fix their DNA other than BRCA. And so they're sensitive to PARP. Well, here's the overall survival in that group from Paula, again, Olaparib, Avastin versus Avastin, 55% versus 44% overall survival. So still a signal um, favoring um, use of Olaparib here with um, Avastin versus Avastin alone. Now, what we don't know is what Avastin alone or what Olaparib alone would have done here. That's kind of the missing piece of this puzzle because maybe you just need Olaparib and you don't need both. We don't know the answer to that. But this just is what we know right now. It's clearly better than um, Avastin alone. And then here's the here's the group that needs our help. This is group the tumors that are homologous recombination deficiency test negative on all the PARP studies. There's a little signal of efficacy here, about a 30% reduction in the hazard of progression. It prolongs that kind of like Avastin did. Um, not huge, but not none. So could be clinically relevant, but you have a discussion with your patient about whether or not they're interested in this. There's a lot more we can do here though. Um, I think to agree that we can do better. And really this is the overall survival in that group from Paula Olaparib. Placebo actually looks like it's on the wrong side here versus Avastin alone. So Avastin probably is a pretty good drug here. The combination didn't add anything. You know, this looks pretty, you know, kind of equivalent, maybe a little bit worse. It's a little hard to explain that. Um, but I think this is just the call to action for this group of tumors that represent about 40% of our population. So it's not small. So what about immunotherapy? Well, this has been largely disappointing with the immunotherapies that we have to date. And those are immune checkpoint inhibitors. 
um, like pembrolizumab or Keytruda or nivolumab, which is Opdivo, um, atezolizumab and Binzi, they all have funny names. But two big studies were done, um, completed, Javelin 100 and Imagine 50, incorporating immune checkpoint inhibitors into frontline chemotherapy. Um, they both looked at biomarkers because we're always trying to figure out how to pick the patients who will benefit the most, like BRCA. Well, can we tell who will benefit from an immune checkpoint inhibitor like we can in lung and other tumors? Well, the answer is no. Um, they did not work at all. Um, in fact, in one of the studies, it looked a little worse. And so this was a big kind of warning sign that maybe we're not on the right path with this class of drugs, at least in the front line. Currently, there are four big frontline studies that completed accrual, and they should start reporting out in 2023. Three of them are combinations of PARP inhibitors, immune checkpoint inhibitors, and bevacizumab, or Avastin. And so we should start seeing these mid next year. And we'll see you know, if there's a role for immune checkpoint inhibitors or not. But this is sort of where we are now. Um, and, I, and I don't intend you to read this whole slide other than to be like, whoa, that's so complicated. This slide is really complicated. Because eh. it is. You know, when we have a patient with BRCA, some number of them are cured. About half of them are going to recur. We see that in solo. But did they recur during PARP or after PARP? And does that matter in terms of what I give you next? I don't know. We need a clinical trial there. BRCA wild type homologous recombination deficient tumors. Same question. We don't know how many are cured yet. We need to see that. Um, PALBA-1 updated progression-free survival to see how many are still progression-free. Some of them are cured. How many of them? And then same questions. How many recur on a PARP? How many recur after a PARP? And does it influence my subsequent response to platinum in such a way I need to make alternative plans for that patient? We are studying that now. And then homologous recombination deficiency test negative. Why are these tumors so good at fixing their DNA? And how can I overcome that so that those curves look more like the homologous recombination deficient tumors. We're working on that with lots of trials. And so what do we do when patients recur, especially after a PARP? Well, what you received in the front line really influences what we use in the second line. Um, if you've had a prior PARP and you didn't get bevacizumab or Avastin, we use bevacizumab. If you had prior bevacizumab and you didn't get a PARP and you respond to your next platinum, we give you a PARP. If you've had both, we need clinical trials. And what about using a PARP again? We did a clinical trial and it was kind of positive, but not really. And really just made us all realize that instead of just trying to reuse things over and over, we need to just keep developing new and effective drugs that will work irrespective of whether your tumor has developed a resistance to PARP or not. So PARP after PARP is a thing, but probably not the best thing for most patients. So in the platinum sensitive space, this is a big area of development in recurrent disease post PARP. Um, there's a number of studies running. Um, the two at the bottom are the newest, oops, sorry about that, are the newest and incorporate antibody drug conjugates as maintenance. So those are very exciting and those are just getting started. So if you're in that kind of category, keep an eye out for those. Adelante, I highlighted here because it was presented at ESMO last week, was an immune checkpoint inhibitor with bevacizumab versus bevacizumab in the platinum sensitive space. And just like in the frontline, imagine 50, it did not work. Um, so that was a, a sad news. I'm not showing you the slide because it was sad. What about when tumors become resistant to platinum here or beyond? Well, the standard of care is chemo plus bevacizumab based on what we call the Aurelia data. And this is our best regimen. And even if a patient's seen prior bevacizumab, we still use this um, because the response rates are quite high, especially with weekly paclitaxel. So this remains um, a very important um, tool in our armamentarium in the platinum resistant space. And with the adjunct advent of cold caps to try and prevent hair loss, weekly paclitaxel is becoming a much more tolerable regimen, although cold caps are not available for everyone, which is a little bit frustrating. But beyond that, we just have monotherapy chemo, which just doesn't work very well. That's the sad truth. It just does not work very well. And so we need to do better. And how are we doing better? These are all the studies that are running. And I see I'm almost out of time, but I'm almost through. These are all the studies that are running right now. Um, and it's a bullseye, meaning in the middle of the bullseye is things that are closest to FDA approval. And so you can see the antibody drug conjugate 
mervituximab, which targets folate receptor alpha, is before the FDA now, and we should hear any moment as to its approval status. And so this drug should be available for you very, very soon if your tumor is folate receptor alpha high. And that's about 40% of high-grade serous. And then you can see the farther away from the bullseye are kind of where those, these are all in clinical trials, but some of them just started and some of them are finished and maturing. But we're looking at lots of combinations with chemo. We're looking at lots of antibody drug conjugates that target different proteins and have different chemos on their tail. We're looking at novel, novel immunotherapy. I'm gonna to talk to you about one of those. And then all sorts of other kind of various things that are just sort of lumped in another category. Lots of things that are not a new version of doxel or gemcitabine, right? These are all very different. So I think the message to you is there's a lot going on. There are a lot of trials available. Um, and if you are in the position of needing one, reach out so we can try and find the most appropriate trial for you. Um, here's sort of a little another look at the landscape, just because everyone's always anxious about timelines and trials always take longer than we want them to. So this is just sort of how you sort of look at the readout. Um, like Mirasol, which is second from the top, is the confirmatory trial of mervituximab. We'll see that probably in first quarter of 2023. And hopefully that'll be a, a, an approval for us. Um, but you'll see the, the remainder of these are kind of heading into 2024 before we have readouts. Even though they're done and maturing, you're gonna have to wait for them to be um, complete. But there's a lot going on here, and this is just an overview of the antibody drug conjugates, which are like targeted chemo. So it's targeted to your tumor, your individual tumor, and it's delivering a super potent molecule of chemo, not doxel or gemcitabine or taxol, totally different, just to your tumor so you don't have all the off, not all of it, but most of the off-target toxicities. So these are really exciting. There's a lot of them in development um, for really, so really anybody We'll have one of the targets that these are targeting um, and should be able to um, participate in some of these clinical trials. Mervituximab, as I mentioned, is closest based on the SORIA study, which was a single arm phase three of mervituximab in folate receptor alpha high platinum resistant ovarian cancer. It had a response rate of 33%. If you compare that to the 13% that we saw in the post Aurelia setting, that's three times as long with about a median of about seven months duration. Um, so we're pretty excited about this drug moving into um, accessibility for everybody, hopefully very soon. And then I'm gonna end with immunotherapy. I know Dr. Jaziri is gonna talk a lot about immunotherapy. So I took that out of my talk, um, which is good because it was too long anyway. But I am gonna just mention one that I'm really excited about and in full disclosure, I'm leading. So this is a cellular therapy. So some of you may have heard about like CAR T th therapy um, or T cell therapy that we use in leukemia, lymphomas, it's curative, kind of amazing. It's moved into solid tumors. And you can see at the bottom, um, lung, gastroesophageal, head and neck, bladder, and ovary, and actually ovary and endometrial, but I know we're just talking about ovary today. So this particular T cell engineered cellular T cell therapy you have to have a certain HLA type, which is about 50% in white people, about 30% in Hispanic. It varies by ethnicity because it's something you're born with. It has nothing to do with your tumor, but it's, but it's important for this drug to work. And then the tumor has to be tested for MAGE. So it is a niche population. It's probably about 30% of the population, but that's who's eligible to undergo. This is kind of a one-time therapy, cellular therapy, we kind of wipe out your bone marrow, and then we give you these army of T cells back to attack your tumor and ovarian cancer. You can see the early results at the top. This was presented last week. I will be presenting updated ovary data at a meeting later in October, um, which I can't show you yet because it's embargoed, but it's really exciting. Um, this doesn't work for everybody, but I have seen it work. So I'm really excited about it. And this surpass three trial that you see down here will be initiating in 2022, which is this year. Um, and you can keep an eye out for it because this may be a therapy we can use like for consolidation, for like homologous recombination deficient pro, you know, net test negative tumors following frontline. Maybe we can use this to consolidate is an idea. You know, that's kind of where I want to move it, but we got to prove it works first in the platinum resistant setting. And so that's where it's going to open. Um, so that's just the one I was going to plug, um, shameless plugs. I'm excited about it, but Dr. Jaziri is going to really take you through immunotherapy in depth because that's his, um, wheelhouse. So I'll leave that to him to do. 
But with that, I'm done. I'm sorry I went a couple minutes over. Um, I'm glad I cut some slides out. And I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. It